Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. In Ahmadu, in Astarina, who in Astorfiru, when I would be lahim in Shururi and Fusina, I mean Sayatia Malina, Mayadi Hilla, who fila modilla, or Mayulil, who fila hadilla, or Shadula, Ilaha illullah, or Hadahula, Sharika, who was Shadu Anna Muhammad and Abduhu Rasulu, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All praise due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from those of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad is his servant and messenger. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul lukthi min lisani yafqahu. Awli subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-ahdeem al-hakeem. Again, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's a blessing to be able to be with you all on this Jummah and wishing you and your families Jummah Mubarak and a blessed Friday. So it's been a couple of weeks since Ramadan ended and you know maybe we left Ramadan feeling that you know we've we left in, in some kind of a disappointment or feeling that because we didn't get to do or achieve the things that we wanted uh, that we feel kind of like we had felt like a failure in a sense that this Ramadan was a failure or we ourselves are a failure in a sense having done that or maybe we're finding ourselves now having gone through what might have been a fairly successful Ramadan or however we choose to describe it that we come out of uh, this a couple weeks later and feeling that we haven't been able to continue the same rhythm or the same stride of Ramadan that we had had prior to uh, when we were in the month itself and that we might feel like we're in some kind of a spiritual rut or you know feeling that we've kind of failed off that track or that we've just you know got, uh, gone off wayward or need to rebound or need to kind of get back on track uh, but are just having a really hard time to do it and so Either way, in in a sense, we're, we're struggling with this aspect of this uh, sentiment and this feeling of failure, which oftentimes gets internalized and becoming in the sense of feeling ashamed of not just who we are, uh, not just what we do, but also who we are. And uh, what's really interesting is, as a tangent, I was, you know, I came across this uh, press conference interview of, you know, NBA star uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and it's making rounds around social media. So maybe you came across it as well, but, you know, Giannis Antetokounmpo is, you know, a forward or a uh, NBA star player for the Milwaukee Bucks. And after his team got eliminated in the playoffs, he had been asked this question by a reporter who had asked him that, do you consider this season to be a failure? You know, the Milwaukee Bucks were, uh, you know, the, they had the best record in in their conference. They were, you know, the favorites to at least, you know, get get to the finals and to, you know, to to go that far. But to lose in the first kind of round of this and and to be uh, ousted as they were was was brought up the question from the reporter that, uh, do you consider this season to have been a failure? And the response of Giannis was one that's gone viral, but you know, and, and one that you could see there's a lot of sentiment that's built up. But the, the crux of his response came in this aspect that he, he he pitched it back to the reporter. He said, Do you feel that every year that you go out and you work your job, every year that you don't get a promotion or that you don't, you know, get that raise or whatnot, do you feel that your entire body of work, that your whole job, your whole year was a failure? And lifted up the example of Michael Jordan. He said, you know, Michael Jordan played 15 years and won six championships, or the other nine years a failure. And he, he, he lifts up this powerful concept that these aren't failures, these are stepping stones, that there's not a, a concept of failure in sports. There's good days, there's bad days. Um, and then the, there's, there's uh, you know, the, the, the space to improve, there's a space to get better. And Michael Jordan, you know, in, in separate spaces would, would lift up that his losses were places that opportunities for growth. And so he kind of reconceptualized this aspect of failure that, you know, was this season, was this whole body of work we did, is it now just labeled a failure? Or do are we able to honor the body of work itself? Because quite honestly, how, how would we then evaluate anything that we do in, in the context of this black and white notion of it's either a success or a failure? And he challenges us in that space to look into the gray 
And we oftentimes, as we mentioned, this concept of failure gets attributed to faith. It oftentimes gets latched on to not just failing with respect to doing the certain things that are expected of us or required of us in faith, but oftentimes internalized that we ourselves, because we haven't been able to do them, we haven't been able to live up to those expectations or to do those things, we ourselves are failures. And so when we look at the context uh, of failure in, in the realm of faith, that it's, it's, it, it's arguable that there is no failure in faith if one is sincere, if one is repenting when they make a mistake, if one is acknowledging and takes ownership of the fact that they've made a mistake and takes the effort or steps to rectify it, that in this spectrum, there is no failure in faith, and especially within Islam, that one does not fail in, in their faith if they also are trying what they're doing, they're trying the best that they can, they do it with sincerity, and when they make a mistake, they acknowledge it, and they don't let that mistake define them, but they use that mistake as an opportunity to continue to improve and to get better. Failure within the concept of faith may be more akin to ignorance or maybe more akin to willful ignorance of acknowledging that we've done wrong or we're, we're just you know uh, absent-minded with respect to all that we do. And we, we feel that we are better than that which is around us. We're not in need of any help. We're not in need of doing anything wrong because we're living exactly how we want. And uh, that, that element of arrogance and ignorance blended together probably is more akin to failure in faith. But sincere trying, sincere effort, stumbling, messing up, but acknowledging that we're, we're trying our best to get better and, and doing the steps to practically get better, that's not failure in the concept of faith. And so we might feel this. And in, in, as I mentioned, you know, as however we condition ourselves, however we kind of tell ourselves, however we're kind of talk, talked about or talked to, and you know, we might feel that in this post-Ramadan space that we have been or that we are failing because we couldn't do what we had hoped in that month, or we couldn't continue the same efforts and the same things that we had put in in that month. And we find ourselves slipping and we find ourselves in this period, two weeks out in a bit of a limbo. And we might think that the things that we're doing are frivolous or our situation feels hopeless and we go into a rut. And we may not just feel that you know, this, this kind of scent of like this, this sentimentalness of a uh, sentimentality of just like, oh, like, I wish I was like that, or, you know, this regret that we have this resentment that builds, we may end up not only feeling guilty and overwhelmed with hopelessness, we may fall into a cycle and a spiral of shame. Dr. Brene Brown lifts up that the important difference, though, between shame and guilt is that guilt is the feeling in a sense of that when we have made a mistake, that I have made a mistake, I've made an error, I've made something, I've done something wrong. And it's one that we can subsequently uh, rectify. It's something that we can acknowledge, we can name, we can identify, and we can work at in the sense of trying to rectify it. It's, it's, it's able to at least be identified in that way and be worked on. Shame, on the other hand, is more internalized. Not just that I've made a mistake, not just that I have uh, done something wrong, but that I am wrong, that I am a mistake. I am, you know, my worst shortcoming, yet you are those things. And it has devastating consequences and correlations with respect to the dangerous cycles of behaviors and, uh, and things that uh, can be linked with respect to addiction, with respect to depression, with respect to substance abuse aggression, suicide, all these different things that kind of come about. Shame, when internalized, when it allows to fester, is, is dangerously correlated with these really dangerous behaviors and these very dangerous kind of outcomes. But what's very curious and very interesting that Dr. Brown looks up is guilt, on the other hand, is inversely correlated to those things. That guilt facilitates that adaptability. It, it's adaptive in a sense that we recognize what might be wrong. We feel something wrong. Something has gone wrong, but we are not our mistake. We acknowledge the mistake that we've done and we take the step to rectify it. And we're able to improve. We're able to get better. We're able to take those steps forward. And it speaks very much to the Islamic concept, the Islamic uh, kind of view with respect to the arc of humanity, the human experience, that Allah loves our efforts. Allah loves our efforts and Allah loves those who try. You know, Allah does not, uh, does not label us specific, does not pigeonhole us in the sense that if we make a mistake, we are defined inherently by our mistake, but gives us and lifts up those opportunities for us 
to uh, not just rectify our mistakes, but to try to continue to uh, improve, even though we know that as a part of our fabric of being, as a part of our humanity, we will slip. We are going to err. We are going to make mistakes. We're going to do things uh, that are not befitting of the divine. But we have an agency that the angels do not have. We have an agency to turn back, to make the choice, to do uh, what is right, to choose what is right over what is wrong, and in a way that elevates us even be, uh, beyond that status. And so our forerunners, our parents, Adam and Hawa, when they made a mistake, they felt guilty. They felt guilty, but they, their guilt compelled them to turn back to their Lord and seek repentance, and their Lord turned back to them with it. They turned back to their Lord saying, do, you know, if you do not accept our repentance, if you do not forgive us, we, we will surely be of those who are of the losers. We'll be surely of those who are lost and wayward and, and, and without guidance. And so they turned back to their Lord. They were overcome by their, uh, their guilt. And, but it, they, it didn't define them in a sense. They didn't say that we are these people. We are, um, you know, our mistake. We are these folks here. Um, but to prevent us from becoming those who are the wrongdoers, from become, becoming those who are, those who are lost, uh, they performed an action, they performed a repentance in fear and hope of not becoming whatever the other aspect of that was, or the, the flip side of it. And Surah Baqarah, and, uh, Allah tells us in the Quran that Allah loves those who, when we say, not, uh, not only loves our efforts, but loves our trying and loves our consistency and going back to the drawing board and doing and doing and doing, that Allah loves at tawabin Allah loves al mutatahirin Allah loves those who repent, Allah loves those who continue to purify themselves, who purify themselves. Not only do they repent when they make a sin or when they do a mistake or when they have a shortcoming, they take an action, they repent, and then they take another step in a sense of purifying themselves. They, they, they go in that sense of making that stepping stone to do what is, uh, to not repeat that mistake in a sense, to not, uh, you know, continue to make that same mistake after they have uh, come to Allah with respect to repentance, and they continue to purify themselves when they have. And the an interesting concept about when we think about this aspect of tahara, or when we think about mutatahirin, those who purify themselves, and when we think about tahara or this purification in our daily, daily lives, you know, we don't just make wudu once and consider ourselves pure and clean throughout the rest of the week or the rest of the day or whatnot, there will be points where that wudu will be broken. There will be times where uh, that, that wudu will not be able to be sustained, and we will have to consistently make this purification. We'll have to consistently cleanse ourselves, not just for the clean, cleanliness aspect. You know, we could take one shower a day and say we're clean, but we continue to wash ourselves. We continue to purify ourselves, not just for that cleanliness aspect, but also for as a means of spiritual resetting, as a means of intentionality, as a means of centering and grounding that we're about to show up into the presence of our Lord. We're about to commune with our Lord. How can we center ourselves in a way that is befitting? And so we consistently purify ourselves. We don't just do it once and say that we are pure, but we have to consistently act on this as a way of realizing the world that we're in the places that we're in are going to continue to distract us. They'll continue to hit us from left and right and back and forth and all these different ways that will cause us to continue to engage in this aspect of tahara, not just literal, but also spiritual. And so where we are right now, spiritually, and where we are with our faith, we've got to be honest, especially in this time after Ramadan. Like I said, you know, we could be feeling like Ramadan was an amazing success. We did great. And we might be, you know, trending upwards, doing whatever it is. So we might not be, feel like we're in a rut. But many of us may feel that after Ramadan, we're, we're kind of like in this valley of sorts. We kind of, you know, had this, had this dip with respect to our spiritual productivity, or our spiritual life. Or we may feel that, you know, we never had gotten to any high place from Ramadan. We just have continued to feel like we're just in some kind of a downward spiral. And so at regardless of where we are on this space, regardless of where we are, it's important that we've got to be honest with ourselves. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be vulnerable with ourselves and ask exactly and tell ourselves honestly, how do we feel and how do we see ourselves right now beyond the different concepts of what people may throw at us or whatnot? How do we, if we were to put it in our own words, see ourselves? Are we feeling shameful? Are we feeling burdened by shame? Do we feel guilty? Do we feel these 
heavier kind of notions that we are beyond the pale of forgiveness, that we're just a mistake, we're, we're, we're just doomed, we're, uh, you know, we'll, we'll never get it right, we're all these things, you know, what, what are the things that come to mind with us? Because if we just are trying to put band-aid solutions to a larger underlying illness and problem, we're not going to get very far with respect to treating it in the long term. But if we're able to diagnose and understand where is the shortcoming, where is, what is that feeling? What are we able to name? And we're able to name that. Is it guilt? Is it shame? Is it these different things? We can then, as, a, as, as you know, is done in the medical sphere, be able to diagnose and identify what are some steps we can take to remedy this spiritual illness or this, uh, you know, kind of internally uh, cri uh, crippling kind of disease that, that's within us, that's, that's grasped onto our spirituality. And so... As we mentioned, you know, when we look at shame, as as, as Dr. Brene Brown had shared, that's it, it. It's it's not only that which has devastating consequences with respect to being correlated to so many destructive behaviors and uh, patterns, but shame is also fueled, as she says, and exacerbated by silence, by secrecy, and by judgment. But it's one that's inoculated and it's dismantled and treated with empathy. And so when we commit a sin, when we make a mistake, we inherently fall into the same trap that our first parents, our parents, Adam and Hawa, uh, may Allah be pleased with them, that, and may, and, and, you know, that they made this mistake that, uh, they, they, that our first parents did when they took Shaitan as a sincere advisor uh, or, and were, were deceived by Shaitan to uh, believe this entity or as someone to, who was a well-wisher to them, who was uh, wanting the best for them. And they slipped into that path and they, they fell into that trap. And the Quran teaches us that shaitan, you know, will come from, come to us, you know, on Sirat al-Mustaqim, as we talked about previously, that be on the right path, but will be someone who will assail us and will be assaulting us from the left, the right, the front, the back, bottom, top, all different spaces and will come at us in this way. But what shaitan offers us on the Sirat al-Mustaqim is bankruptcy is that which may uh, look good, it might be appealing, it might be nice on the outside, but on the inside, it's rotten. It has no benefit. There's no nutritional benefit. There's no spiritual benefit to what shaitan offers us. And in fact, it is sin in the participation of what shaitan offers us, inherently what it, it, what it offers us and what its benefit is or what its, you know, uh, it, it, its side effect is, is inherently one that is isolation, is inherently one that not only breeds isolation and continues to increase the isolation, but in, as, as we, we've discussed here, it, it incubates the concept of shame and the feeling of shame and the internalization of shame, which becomes a very difficult thing to overcome. And so on the other hand, guilt is when we, when we, when we, when we recognize that how we're feeling with respect, we're feeling guilty about certain things, we're feeling uh, that we, we need to modify or address our guilt, that is one that's addressed and remedied through uh, some sort of acknowledgement, some sort of action. And in our tradition, from very first humans to our point now, in our tradition, this asks, this is doba. This is seeking repentance and turning to our Lord. And our Prophet Sallallahu had taught that if we as a community were not sinners or not a community that sinned, Allah would raise a new people that would sin so that Allah could then uh, subsequently uh, forgive them and, and, and offer them this, uh, this forgiveness and, and repentance and accept their repentance. And so what it tells us is that our sin and our mistakes do not define us, but what we choose to do with our sins, what we choose to do with our mistakes, how we choose to live with respect to our mistakes and our sins, how we choose to go about, that is what defines us. Our effort is what defines us or our lack of effort is what defines us. So wherever we might be right now in this post-Ramadan space, wherever we might be, let us tell ourselves first and foremost where we are versus where we might have been or where we hope we may have been. This is not a failure, that we are not failures because of where we are right now versus maybe where we had been or where we want to be. That our shortcomings are those that do not define us. That our best versions of ourselves are those which might actually be yet to come, but it will require us in order to get to that higher space that it will require us to first acknowledge, to act, and to then subsequently improve or to purify ourselves, and as well as to subsequently connect. Our father Adam and Hawa were 
those whom Allah had commanded the angels to Adam, they said prostrate to, uh, to Adam, you know, submit yourself to Adam, uh, acknowledging that this was the creation that you are, uh, that, that, that is superior in a sense, they prostrate to Adam. Um, and the angels, you know, had, 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 had prostrated and at least did not, but the angels had also, uh, you know, had, had, had a bit of a dialogue in Surah Baqarah with respect to when Allah says, I'm appointing a, a Khalifa on the earth, I'm appointing a vice, vicegerent on the earth. And they said, we bring someone to the forefront who causes facade, who causes disputes and is going to spread bloodshed and violence. And Allah says, I know that which you do not know. But in Adam's fall, in Adam and Hawa's uh biting of the forbidden fruit or of uh, leading, being led into the temptation that shaitan had offered through deception. In that fall, uh, the, the rise of Adam had gone, uh, had been, uh, been able to come about because of the repentance, because of the turning to repentance, because of the turning back to one's Lord, Adam's rank had ascended past that of the angels, past that of those who um, were in that divine kind of counsel and accompanying it. So you see that Adam's ascent had come even after uh, what may have been a defining mistake. He wasn't defined by his mistake. Adam and Hawa were not defined by their biting of the fruit or their original sin as may be in other traditions, but they're defined by their turning back, their repentance, their seeking of repentance. And so in this context here, that you know our, our shortcomings, as we mentioned, they don't define us. Our sins here do not define us, and our best versions of ourselves can still come when we identify how we are going to deal with these concepts and how we're going to deal with these shortcomings. Not that they define us, but that they are things that we can continue to remedy. Our Prophet taught us that uh, to repent from, from a sin, to take action to remedy a sin, is a polish. You know, it, it removes it from the heart. It, it 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 polishes that in the heart. And we know things that need to be polished need to continuously be polished. They don't just get polished once and stay. Similarly, they don't just get washed once and stay pure. They have to continuously. It's an act that continues to be done. So, but in a way that improves. And so, for those of us who may feel that we might be faring better, as we lifted up an antidote to this aspect of shame is empathy. So. Whether we are in the rut itself or whether we are kind of uh, in a better space, the important aspect that comes out from this is we need to all connect. For those of us who might be faring better, it may be that we try our best to hold a safe, empathetic, non judgmental space for uh, those of us and for all of us to allow us to grow, to allow us to not be consumed by the guilt and subsequent shame of our sins, but allow us to recognize that as humans, we are going to mess up, we're going to make mistakes but we can only become as, uh, as, as, as we are destined to and as above and beyond what we are hoped to be if we all are able to acknowledge collectively, if we're all able to improve collectively, if we're all able to get to a space that uh, is, is beyond any of those limited mistakes that are there. Our religion offers us a infinite amount of reward, an infinite amount of benefit, and an infinite amount of blessing uh, for those limited, tangible, um, and seemingly innocuous remedies for the finite sins that exist. So when we turn back to our Lord in repentance, when we make those mistakes, when we fall off the beaten road, when we go into a different path, when we've done great and we've kind of fallen out different ways, uh, coming back to this path, doing what we can to get to a better space, and, and making a sincere effort, making a sincere turning back to our Lord, doing what we can and not being consumed by the shame and guilt, can actually bring about our best selves and actually bring about the better versions that we had not imagined or that had probably not been the case in Ramadan. So just know that our better days are still ahead, inshallah. It starts with one particular thing that we can do uh, and, and, and that, that doesn't necessarily need to be addition, but it can be addition through subtraction. We are able to be honest with ourselves. We're able to evaluate how do we really feel? Do we feel ashamed? Do we feel guilty? What do we feel guilty about? What do we feel ashamed about? And then feeling, how can we then tackle it from there? Um, but if we can identify one particular thing that is holding us down, we can then zero in on it to then try and acknowledge it. And again, if it is something that we're guilty about, how do we go about the steps of rectifying it in a sense of first foremost acknowledging it, but then what are the steps to being able to rectifying it? And subsequently, if we are feeling ashamed about something, what is it that we are feeling ashamed about? and being able to have that conversation as well. But the last thing we'll say is that, as we had said, 
Sin in our tradition is one that breeds isolation. It's one that inherently keeps us distant and keeps us in, in, in a space that uh, is on our own uh, and, and, and you know, left and in, in just kind of off to the side and uh, feeling disregarded, feeling you know, hopeless in a sense. But the remedy for sin in Islam is repentance. And what repentance is, is, uh, is essentially divine communion, is going back to one's Lord, which, may, which can be, and oftentimes is done in secrecy as well, and is done in those spaces that are uh, on our own. So we may be feeling that we're isolated by our sin, but the remedy for this sin, the remedy for this, this kind of space here is to turn back to one's Lord in communion in that space. Inshallah, may Allah enable us to rebound spiritually, however we might have been in Ramadan, after Ramadan, and enable us to be of those who not only try, who not only turn back to our Lord, but are those who continue to purify and allow us to be of those who are guided to the right path, the path of those whom Allah has uh, bestowed his pleasure and not of those who attain Allah's dis displeasure or lose his favor. And may Allah enable us to leave this Juma better than we had come into it and allow us to go into every day and every space better than we had entered it. Inshallah. Amin. Rabbana antakabal minna inna ka antasamil alim. Our Lord accept this from us. Indeed, you are the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Assalamu alaikum wa